Hello, lovely people. Hope you're doing marvelously well. I'm sitting here with my friend John Maddox. How are you? I'm good. Hi, Warren. We welcome, actually, welcome to Bright Orange Studios. That's what I was about to ask you. Bright Orange Studios. And why would that be? Um, you know, it's kind of silly seeing as it's quite orange in here and it's quite bright. Well, you go into a lot of studios and there's a lot of white or sometimes a lot of black. Mm -hmm. And I didn't want that. And I thought, what color could you possibly tolerate sitting in for eight, nine, ten hours? Green? No. Blue? No. Pink? Definitely not. Somehow I've just landed on orange uh, and a little bit of yellow in the live room there. So it was more about that. Good. You know? It's, it's descriptive. It makes sense. And then I found out that apparently orange is actually a, one of the colors that stimulates creativity. Oh, it so is? So I found out about that afterwards. So I, there you go. I didn't know that. I, I was like blue and green. I think that's quite typical, isn't it? Because it's sort of earthy. Not good for creativity? No, I, if it works. It, it depends if it's, is it a light blue or a light green, or is it a dark blue, dark green? You like how I said that? All right, All right so Bright Orange Studios. So what I want to do is I want to do talk to you about three different things. Firstly, your journey. And secondly, I want to talk about what you're doing at the moment. Okay. Which is a combination of film and TV licensing music, I suppose, I presume trailers and commercials and all that good stuff. John, if you don't know him, is an amazing drummer and did a lot of sessions as a drummer, and was in the Young Dubliners. And so you have a successful career as a drummer, and you've moved that into film and TV licensing work. I am from L.A. Born in Inglewood, raised in Orange County, then came back to L.A. when I started playing professionally, more professionally. So I grew up in Orange County. Uh, my first professional gigs were like playing cover bands, some studio work, and there was a pivotal gig I was doing at like a hotel, tuxedo on, playing like Girl from Ipanema, and I was probably 21 or 22, playing with guys twice my age. And you know, you make decent money, and I remember thinking, this is it? This is why I work so hard? I mean, you know, you're, you're playing around and you're making money doing casuals and things, but it didn't feel like the music business, right? Because uh, people like to talk about this wall between Orange County and LA, and, and that used to, it used to sort of be a thing. But I realized if I wanted to actually be in the music business, I need to move to LA, which at that point I was auditioning for different bands because uh, I had this like crazy notion that you could get paid as, as a musician. So I was trying to find a gig as a drummer that you could get paid for. And I found a whole bunch of gigs where I would actually have to pay them, like studio, like rehearsal room time. Went through a long process and ended up finding the Young Dubliners, which at that point were had been playing around for years, they'd got a bit of a following, and they had a club in Santa Monica called Fear City, so they were playing every Saturday night and had a pretty big following. And I thought, wow, this is, this is really cool. And the guitar player in the band used to own this shop called Midi Drum Center in Hollywood, which uh, goes way back, but I had actually been there to buy like drum cat, you know, electronic drums kind of stuff. Uh, and I was up in LA, auditioning for different people and stop by. And he goes, oh, what are you doing? I'm like, I want to move to LA. You know, I want to find a good band to play in and, and you know, do something. And he goes, well, my band's looking for a drummer and you'd be the perfect guy. <laughs> <laughs> and that was the Young Dubliners. So yeah. I auditioned for them and, you know, just basically kind of got in there right away. And then shortly after starting to play with them, they got their first record deal. Um, we did our first tour and you know, vans, right? Mm -hmm. And then kind of there was this upward climb of like touring in vans, and then we got an RV, which I don't necessarily recommend to everybody. Um, I know that one. But we bought an RV, that's a long story. But then we got to tour we buses. did the same thing. Did you really? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, because like breaking down in the heat of like summer in Texas is not I fun. did it in Van Hall in <laughs> Texas, same thing. Starter motor went out. But you would be underneath with a hammer smashing the starter motor trying to get it to start. Oh, man. And you're, you're hauling, because, and, and that was a big band. There were seven people in the band mm -hmm. at that time and like three in the crew. So that's 10 people you're hauling around. Plus, you got a, a, a U haul full of gear. On the back, yeah. Uh, and traveling through the, <laughs> I mean, that was not smart. And it was an older RV, too. So, so it was, um, so was ours. That's so all we could afford. So that was, mm -hmm. that was the, but then it got into the tour bus. And then, then it was like, wow. And then you have a, a driver, and it's like, whoa. So that was, that was a fun you know, upward journey being in that band. 
a couple of things. I want to fill in some gaps. So you're 21, you decide to move to L.A. Do you have any formal drum education? Did you take lessons? I did. My father was a musician. and What did he play? He played, he was a trombone major in college. He also played drums. He also played bass, and he started as a keyboardist. So he was a multi-instrumentalist guy. So I grew up in with a music room in the house that had piano, stand-up bass, and drums. Mm -hmm. And as a kid, I was never a, like, wanted to be good at any drums. I just was a music lover. And I, I think that's how most people start, is they just love music. And, and, yeah, I, same way. and I loved it. And, you know, because my dad was a musician, I think it was just like, it. It's not that it wasn't special, but if your parents aren't into music, music is like really super special. So I kind of grew up with instruments and his bands would rehearse and it was just like, ah, you know, something my dad happens to do. And it wasn't until like late high school when I started to like, oh, Stuart Copeland, how does he do all that stuff? Mm -hmm. And so I was self-taught at that point, just playing, figuring out, you know, how he does all those cool police licks. Because there was something about his drumming that for me, just like, pulled me in like sure. there was some, something about that um so exciting and and so i you know i taught myself but when i got out of high school and started playing with other people because i was kind of a, technically a late bloomer i didn't jam with guys in high school it was wasn't until college that i actually um started playing with people in fact college orange coast college where i went to school they had a program called rock ensemble which was rock actually, ensemble. So you actually got college credit for playing rock music. And what they did was they paired you up with, you, you kind of do an audition, right? They, they, they kind of like say, okay, Warren on bass, John on drums, you know, Eric on guitar. And then you'd kind of go through songs and the teachers would evaluate you and then put you with... Eric, you got the guitar gig. Similar, <laughs> similar um, levels. And then you'd learn songs, you'd perform mm -hmm. for the class. And then they had professional players that were teaching the class and they'd critique you. So it was, as funny as it might sound, it was actually, it was, it was good. So I met people, and it was there that uh, I saw Chad Wackerman do um, a performance, because he was one of the people brought in to, you know, play through songs, and like, these how, th this is how professionals sound, you know, mm. and, and he was great, and I just went up to him, and it's like, do you teach drums? And he's like, yeah. So I started studying with Chad. And, wow, that's so... And I'd studied with a local guy <coughs> named Joe Z and did a little bit, but actually with Chad, it, it, like he, he brought me from not being able to read very well to you know, going through all kinds of reading and chart reading, and he would bring charts from sessions when they would do jingles back in the day, so he would kind of like show me the charts. So Fantastic. that was as basically as formal as I guess you, you could say, but Chad was like the first guy, and then I studied with an, um, my friend Roy Burns, who in his 20s was playing with like a lot of the swing era guys mm -hmm. um, like um, Benny Goodman, Woody oh, Herman, yeah. Lionel wow. Hampton, but he was a kid playing with those guys. Wow, that's amazing. So he kind of turned my head and he was like definitely like a drum mentor, but he was a lot of storytelling and how to work with people and you know things to think about as you're entering this professional world, not so much about drum licks and how to play an odd time like you know as much as he we worked on like snare drum technique and things he would talk about what it was like to be a professional and the things that happen and oh, that's and, huge and and yeah. and that is huge because you know that's some some those are the, the stories are some of the things you don't get in college you know you get all this technical mm -hmm. skill but when it really starts to happen is when you meet somebody that's experienced and they can say well yeah maybe that's what they did in school but this is kind of how we do it here, sure. you know, and that's that was that was pretty valuable, I think. That's huge. Now, I, I I I didn't have any formal training. I didn't go to school or anything, but um, I completely relate to I suppose mentors, people that help set me on. Uh, you know, even just my friend Ollie, though I talk a lot about whoever's watched me here. The thing about Ollie was he showed me stuff. He did show me stuff, but the biggest thing that he showed me was like taste. He's like. Oh, you want to you want to have good legato? Listen to Alan Holdsworth. You want to have really expressive playing? Go listen to Jeff Beck. You want to have the world's greatest vibrato? Listen to Paul Kossoff. You want to have some great rhythm chops? Go listen to Keith Richards and John Lennon. You want to have weirdness? Robert Fripp. I mean, it was all like boom, 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 boom. You want to have great right hand technique? Aldo Miola. Like you put all that together, you could, that's the, you know. So, so before that, were you like a chops guy at all? I was just a kid. I was just a kid that was sort of like. I just, you know, I, I had genres that I liked, you know, like anybody else. I love Brian May, which, of course, is an incredible 
way to start playing guitar. But he's like, okay, you like all these things. Here's the guys that are like the kings of these areas. Now go listen to them. And then, of course, near the end, when I started to get pretty good, he said, now listen to Joe Pass. Now listen to Joe Pass and go, oh, okay. I don't know anything. But you, but you were open to it. I was totally open See, to it. See, that's, that's the thing that a mentor can do. Because is, you respect is, the mentor. Is left to your own devices, yeah. whether it's Stuart Copeland or Yngwie Malmstream or whomever, you mm -hmm. might get blindsided by technique because sure. you want to be like that guy and wow, he's successful, so I can play just like him. Mm -hmm. But you, the, 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 whole, the, the whole thing that happens is uh, a mentor can show you like the real world. Mm -hmm. And if you're open to it, they can show you, like, check out Ringo Starr or check out, you know, Charlie Watts. Well, I think it's probably different for different people, but for me, I was open to it because Ollie picked up an acoustic guitar or plugged into an amp, and he just was a blindingly incredible player that had all of these things, the right-hand technique, the legato, the feel, and all this stuff. He was what I wanted to be, so it was all very, right. like Chad Wackerman. I mean, obviously, the guy's an incredible musician. So it inspires, you're like, okay, you know what, I'm just going to shut the whatever up and listen to this guy, and if he tells me I should think about this seriously, I'm going to trust him because, you know. So I think that that's, it's difficult because it's like with YouTube and online training, it's like there's a lot of online stuff there, but I go to people where i like, well, I want your career. It's like, a, you know that phrase, it's like looking for in others what you want in yourself. So you see something and like, oh, I want to be like John. He, he does film and TV licensing. He writes music for trailers and stuff. Okay, I want to know how did he get there. Right. And what did he do as opposed to somebody who's selling how to do it but doesn't actually do it. Right. And there might be value in that. but um... Yeah, I mean, there's, there's, that's, that's what schools are for, I think. Right. But you see, what I love about the school experience that you just explained is... It wasn't so much, you know, necessary. I didn't hear you talk about any specific teaching thing. But what I did hear you talk about is how you got a sense of community, where you were pulled together with people and other musicians. And I think that that's another thing I love about what we get to do on YouTube and stuff, is we get to have people interacting. And I see people commenting with each other. And I see, you know, I'm blessed to have this academy. And so I get people, like, inside of that making music together. And recording and producing. We're all in this world together. Mm -hmm. And so this whole idea of, yes, it is a, com a competition, it's a competitive business, mm -hmm. but that doesn't mean you can't be friends with people and, and mm -hmm. share and, and encourage each other because I want to stay inspired. I get inspired by people. I get inspired by your videos. It's like to, to keep that going. Thank you. How much do I owe you? Do you take cash? No. <laughs> but you know what I'm saying? It's like, it's like, being able to actually inspire somebody else, mm -hmm. I think is a huge thing. Because we, we take for granted our day-to-day -day Pro Tools world and engineering, and uh, even in your case, you're working with you know big artists, like to a lot of people, this is like voodoo and magic. It's like, how do they do that? Mm -hmm. And to you and me, like getting around Pro Tools or Logic or whatever, it's like second nature at a certain point. It's like you just do your thing, you get in there. But to a lot of people, they have no idea. I'm sure you've had this happen too, where you're working with somebody and they're overlooking your shoulder and they're like, how did you know that was the letter, you know, that, how did you know that was the word woo, you know, or, or whatever it is that you're editing. You're like, oh, it's just that blob right there. And they're like, oh, you know, it like, that seems like the matrix, sure. you know, to a lot of people. Well, and plus your ear. I mean, I, you know, I'm listening to a piece of music and I'm like, oh, we should go to the minor in the bridge. There might be only one minor change. It's like, I know where that is. And, you know, I think that that's a big part. I think being musical is a is a huge. Not when it comes to producing and engineering. Traditionally, it was engineers that weren't always musicians and didn't always have ears, and they would gravitate to become producers. And there was value in that when there was huge budgets because I could hire an incredible arranger and an incredible this and an incredible that, and I could tell them what I wanted and they could do it. But now it's relying on guys like you and I to do all of that. Somebody comes in with their budget which can easily be enough for us to feed our families. It's a good budget. It's not a budget to hire 50 people, but it's a budget to you know, pay our bills and, and make music, which is available to lots of people these days. You know? Within that budget, we have to co-write the song, play the instruments, you know, engineer, produce, mix it, all this kind of stuff. And, uh, and if it's an instrument that we don't play, to have somebody on speed dial that we can call and say, hey, right. hey, John, I've only got X number of dollars. Would you come down and play on this track? And you're like, sure, yeah, because it's a community. So I think you're touching on something I love as well, which is you talked about, uh, was it Roy Burns you said? Yeah. You talked about him and you talked about like how he taught you how to integrate. You didn't say that word, but that's what I got. Like integrate and work with others. And I think that's a big, big skill because I see a lot 
and I'll get off my high horse for a second, but I see a lot of videos talking about technical, but there's not enough talk about like you you work with the people you like. Right. More than you work with a person that's like technically the best at the job because the technical side can be taught. And I can email Eric and I do. Eric, can you boost 60 hertz? Can you cut this? Can you do that? Blah, blah, blah on a kick drum and turn it up 1 dB in the choruses. And he'll do it. And that's fantastic. You can do the technical stuff, but the skills we're talking about are, are you know. I think it's like knowing what to listen for, mm -hmm. you know, and that whether you're playing an instrument, you know, knowing how to actually do it is what you hear in your head. I mean, that's, that's sure. a huge thing. And that's why it's easy to get blindsided by technique is you don't just want to be playing simple beats, right? You want to do something more impressive to yourself and, you know, probably impress other people. But mm -hmm. at a certain point, you have to integrate with other people called a band or getting sure. hired as a studio guy. And you have to like be kind of thrown into the fire because you might think, oh, let me set up that China symbol. I just bought this thing and it's, <laughs> and it's rad. We had an off camera China conversation. Um, <laughs> but, and, and, and then hopefully, like you were saying, you were open to suggestions too. I, I, I have a funny China story about one of the first professional sessions I did, and at that time I had a freaking China symbol, and I thought it was the coolest thing. And I was setting up, and the producer says, you don't need to set that up, it's not that kind of a song. And part of me at that moment was like, no, wait a minute, this is part of my sound, you know, I'm thinking to myself. Right, right. But then I was like, wait a minute, this is, I'm getting paid for this, let me just take it down, put up a crash, and it was, it was fine, it was, it was all good. Um, but yeah, China symbols can be not your friend in the recording studio, no. for sure. But just being open to that, though—that's sure. that's the whole point—is. Um, well, you arrive you, at your arsenal. If you're if you're hired as a session drummer, you want to you want to arrive at the ninety nine percent of the time this kit does the job. It's probably a twenty two, possibly a twenty four, but usually like a twenty twenty two. You've probably got something of like a superphonic with a backup black beauty. You know, there's things. You usually vintage Zildjian's have a darker sound, a little friendlier for most engineers. So, I'm not going to mention other makes, but there's some that are too aggressive and too bright. You might get to the room, it's a little bright, and suddenly, oh, schnizzle, I wish I bought my darker symbols because this room's so bright. You know, but you might have the bright symbols sitting in the back. You're going to have two or three versions of a snare, and maybe you have a 26 thrown in the back of the uh, the back of the, the, the car because the guy goes, oh, I want that big bottom sound. You're like, aha. And right. you, maybe you bought a cocktail kit as well. Who knows? Depending on the session. But that's, well, hopefully you've had a conversation yeah. before. So you don't have to bring But I think truck, even if you did have a conversation, I think if you bought your 22 standard kit with something like a superphonic, the cymbals we're talking about, and a couple of snare variations, like a trashy old Rogers snare or something, something that's... Got character. <laughs> got character, you know. Because that's, that's true of a guitar player, isn't right. it? Guitar player, Telly, Strat, Les Paul, a couple of decent acoustics. Maybe once out of a thousand times you get asked to play classical. But again, you'd probably be hired on that pretense. Somebody would call you up and go, we're doing a little jazz date, so I want you to bring a cocktail kit. Right. That would be very specific, but yeah. So that's, yeah, those are the things that aren't taught, but are acquired knowledge that after you've done, which I love, because when I hire an experienced session drummer, I pretty much just hire the drummer. I don't usually have to have much of a conversation because they've been beaten up by Matt Zaletic, Rick Rubin, Rob Cavallo, you know, all these different guys they've played for. So by the time they get to me, and I think too, it's don't you great. think, <laughs> do, do you, don't you think like, they make me look good. Session, <laughs> session musicians means a little bit different than it might have meant like 20 yes. or 30 years ago when, when you were getting hired to do a jingle for an accurate commercial and you were very functional. Charted. And, and it was all written out and the arranger mm -hmm. wrote out what he wanted you to play on guitar and you know, don't dare play a, a solo or whatever it happens to be. But like session drumming or mm -hmm. session musicians now, you know, at least the way I've always approached it is, I don't want to sound like a session drummer. Mm -hmm. And I know that does, some people might get confused by that, but like a typical session yeah. musician has a history of being a functional person that's just gonna play very basic, oh, it's just a senior songwriter, sure. it's just G, E minor, okay, and you're, you kind of dial in the parts, you know, you, you phone in the parts, and I don't want to be that guy. No, and I love where you're going, because you're, you're hitting on something that I get asked all the time, and I have to tell people when they, they ask me about, can I come and play with you, and I can do this and do that, and they talk about their education, and I always go to this, and I think you're nailing this, is like, I need a guy, the great players sound like they're in the band. 
That's where I was going with it. Mm -hmm. But sounding like you've been in the band for like five or 10 yeah. years. Like, okay, I'm playing with the songwriter. If I was playing this song for five, 10 years, what would I be playing? Mm -hmm. Not just like, oh. Eight Not here's a part that fits. You know, that's really and, cool. And, yeah. uh, you know, part of that comes with experience, but I also think when you start writing music and you start understanding how music is put together and how parts work, and especially if you're fortunate to be a producer and work with people, like that all informs what you do as a session musician in ways a guy fresh out of college or you know fresh out of high school or something they're still like in technique land going oh i think this sounds right can i play these like flamadiddle things that i just you know have been practicing all morning it's like that stuff won't fly right. and, and and then you see the guys any one of our heroes uh i had lee sklar in here um at one point I love for, it. for a session and i was all excited because uh, like Billy Cobb's uh, Spectrum is like a great a great album, and Leon's he, such a straight ahead and, normal, and he was guy. so mellow. Yeah, and he actually took some direction, you know, and and was mm -hmm. just like super nice. And guys that have been around and have that kind of experience typically tend to be like Lee Sklar. Yeah, Lee, Sean Hurley, very similar kind of players that they play the song immediately. Like, and there's no ego. Yeah, there's no and, ego. And these are the guys that could actually, they could, they... They could stretch they, their they, wings and do anything. Well, they, 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 they could have the ego. Yeah. Like, they mm -hmm. deserve to have an ego, but they are ego-less. And, yeah. and there's something to be learned from that, I think. It's funny. Um, I'm going to do something. Completely, just because you, you went on this. This is interesting. I just did a session with David Foster. And David wanted a bass player for it, so I called Sean Hurley. And David in real time played the song back, he played the piano on it, and he wrote that for Sean by ear. Wow. So when Sean turned up, he was in and out in 20 minutes. I mean, he literally turned up to the studio, I had the bass amp set up, I played bass, I set it up, and he turned up and met everybody, shook hands, and 20 minutes later he left. We'll get a still of that. Oh. But David, no, but yeah, it's fine. Da <laughs> David wrote that in, in real time. I think he went back and I think he see rubbed out one thing maybe somewhere. Right. Just double checked it. So firstly, he, David Foster is obviously an incredible talent, but that's he, his skill set, you know. His skill set. Um, but what was interesting is you might say, well, you know, Sean Hurley is an incredible musician, and often I just hire him. Not often, pretty much most of the time, I hire him just to play the right right thing, and I don't have to think too much about it. But he's also a player that's educated enough that can take the direction and play the part. When I say it was in and out in 20 minutes, it was two takes. Wow. So 20 minutes is the time it takes to say hello and meet everybody who's in the room, plug in, you set the compression differently because I play differently to he does, of course, get it set right. right. He plays it down once, he reads it, says to David, what's this? Oh yeah, I should have done a blah, 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 punch, do, you know, do one more take, punch in for a fix and bye-bye. And, but the lesson for that is he could have played his own part and it would have been just as amazing. But David had a, a thing in mind, so I think you know being able to move between, be those two different people is, is, is a massive thing. So I, do, I don't read very well, and luckily guitar players don't get asked to read that often. Right. As often as drummers in particular, and then bass players, et cetera, but definitely drummers, you, you guys, not all the time, but you, are, you get it a lot more than we do. Yeah, um, or you know, um, and if you don't, you just write a little cheat sheet arrangement yeah. chart, you know, something like that. Well, I've got another one with Vinny somewhere. Do I have that? So Vinny had a... <laughs> Vinny Caliuta? Yeah, Vinny, I did a song with him a couple of months ago, and Vinny, we played the song back, and Vinny says, um, chart's wrong. He goes, the chart's wrong, that we gave him. Was he nice about it? Oh, yeah. Yeah, and so, so we sat, and he made all his adjustments. Oh, okay, some of the rhythm things were off. Yeah. But he just listened to the track down, and he's looking at the chart, and he's reading it as it's going down. He goes, that's wrong. That's wrong. Right. Well, he's the man. Oh, yeah, he's insane. But, yeah, that's a chart. We'll get another still, still of that. And he probably did it in one take, right? His first take was first take sounded like he had been playing it for 10 years, yeah. Because not only did he play, and we'll get stills of this, obviously, Eric, but not only did he play this um, as written, he played it with groove. So he wasn't just like, because, I mean, if we can, we'll have the still up for a little bit longer, but there's a 5 4 bar, uh, there's 4 4 5 4s, um, more 5 4s, um, 
The bar has been written as a 5-4. He changed it. It's actually a 7-4. Yeah. The another 5-4 was a 7-4. That was a 6-4. It was another 7-4. I mean, you know, he was hearing this stuff. And not only did he do this, Tony Franklin was the bass player, so he wrote it and then gave it to Tony. He was like, here's the new chart. Right, and, <laughs> and, and they're the guys that are getting hired to do it because they're going to play that chart, and it's not going to sound like all of a sudden it's changing in all these weird meters. They're going to make it sound musical. Like, like it's just... That's the, way, that's the way the music goes. Vinny does this thing where he, um, you know, he does all he does all the, the ghost notes and the stuff that you want, which is you know, but he's playing in seven and five and three and two and one and whatever. It's all, <laughs> it's just stupid. He's playing these complicated parts, which for me as a guitar player would just be like to play the part. Right. But he's doing what we're talking about. He's making it sound like he's been on the road with the band, and he's he's done that. So he's bringing. So much more wealth to it, but I don't want to get. Um, it's my fault. I don't want to get too much on the technical, but um, uh, I, lo I love these kind of things because I don't want to stop. Because let's be honest, the two situations I've just shared there are David Foster and Vinnie Carluta doing a string arrangement date. I do those about once every six years. Okay. I've worked with Vinnie a bunch of times, but the last time I heard, hired Vinnie, it was to play a blues track, and it, it was because it was a present for my friend Ollie. And he had introduced me to all of his great musicians, so I wanted to do a track for him to play on that had Vinnie Kailuta on it. Right. Who was Jeff Beck's drummer, of course, and he introduced me to Jeff Beck, so it was my present back to him. I had Dan Rothschild playing bass and Tim Pierce playing nice. all the rhythm guitar. So I got like the, these great musicians so that he could then solo and sing over, you know, and uh, it, was, it was a present back to him for... For, for being such a great mentor. That's most of the time, if I was hiring Vinny, it would, it, it, obviously, when you do the crazy ones, he's the guy to hire, but he's also a guy you hire when you don't do crazy. Right. I mean, you would say most of your, a lot of your work is like senior songwriters mm -hmm. and bands, because that's yeah. been my experience here, too, is, yeah. is uh, I've definitely worked with a lot of songwriters and some bands that have never been in a studio before. Sure. And that's... A, yeah. I don't want to say it's a challenging thing, but but it is because when it ends up happening, it's like when you when you do work on your house, it always takes longer and costs more than you expect it to. Sure. You know, because the band might come in and they think everything is hunky dory and they haven't really done any pre production. They just come in and play what they're doing. All of a sudden you play what they've done and then they realize like they're all playing all the time and they're scratching their heads like, is that what we sound like? It's like that's what you sound like. The, the studio can reveal all those all all, all those things. And in, in, usually, in a, hopefully, in a good way. Yeah, in a great way. But yeah. like when you work with songwriters, you're obviously working with like arrangements of songs, mm -hmm. parts of songs, and you're helping them see their vision of what their music is, you sure. know, fleshed Absolutely. out in this, not so much just with one mic playing acoustic guitar. Like, and it's different, right? When when you bring in a drummer and a bass player, if they're just used to playing guitar, it can be overwhelming. You know, to to hear music realized in this whole different way, but hopefully, pre-production, you know, you can do a fair amount of sketching out of what it's going to sound like. Right. My studio mentor is a guy named Matt Forger. Hello, Matt Forger, and um, you should know him. Everybody's heard him because he worked with Quincy Jones and Michael Jackson. Like he did, he worked on Thriller and Bad and Dangerous, and like ten years of his career was in that world mm -hmm. as an engineer and uh, a technical advisor and did all kinds of crazy things. But he and I became friends and started to work on projects together. And so when I was building the studio, he actually helped with de design because he specializes in acoustics. Um, he also specializes in, in gear. Like, you know, my career went from being a drummer that shows up for a session with my drums. I come in and I look at some ratty old piece of gear and it's like, what's that old piece thing? And they're like, oh, no, no, it's the Fairchild. You know, they're, they're like, it's the most expensive gear in the studio. I'd be like, really? You know, because as a studio player or whatever musician, if you're not in the engineering and studio world, you're just playing music, you don't really know about this stuff. Mm -hmm. So that's where I kind of came from uh, originally and always had the love of recording and was always making a little de demos, but it wasn't like actually like a, a professional studio. It kind of evolved too. Like I can show you pictures before I had the Altex, you know, I just had the, um, the events and in the live room, originally there was no uh, sound treatment panels. It was just kind of a room. So it kind of evolved over, over sure. time. My old drum room uh, went, you know, when I used to have that big blue drum room over at Swing House. Oh yeah, right. Just threw I up recorded. That's where we recorded, right. Yeah, I threw up panels and randomly and, oh, sounds good, stop. <laughs>
Right. Like it's sounds bad, sounds bad. Oh, sounds good. Stop. And that was it. That was the end. And that, that was a big room too. It was a big room, and that's the drums on How to Save a Life. That's the drums on a lot of big records. It was drums on a James, James Blunt uh, big hit. It was, it, but it was not planned. It was just happened. Right. And I moved mics around until it started to sound good. Did you try with different kinds of surfaces, or did you have like curtains kind of, and things, or no curtains, but just different panels? I mean, it really was quite random. We didn't, and I think actually the random worked in a fairly square box. But the other thing that was beautiful about it is it had those big. What do you call those ceilings? Vaulted. Vaulted. But it was you know, it's the Hollywood buildings. They're all curved. Oh, okay. Right. And it was wood. Right. And it was wood frames. So that was nice because it's there's no like direct standing waves because it's all nicely curved. And right, there's not, not a lot of this. Yeah. So that that was purely accidental, but high curved ceiling, wooden. Um, and so many random surfaces that we it didn't really seem to have any standing wave issues. So, um, But totally accidental, no planning, um, you know, trial and error and, and luck. You know, I would say luck. I don't believe in luck as specifically because you have, we had to do a lot of work to get it to be, to be lucky. But... Using your ears to a point where you're like, oh, it sounds good, stop. Exactly. Probably could have got better if I knew what I was doing. But. Well, but <laughs> there's this thing, right? This point of diminishing returns, whether it's talking about what you're talking about, like, okay, maybe there's a better mic position, you sure. know? But this one sounds really good. Right. Depending on your time and budget money, which you're usually not very big, just go with it. But part of you wants to th think, well, what if I just try it over here? And it's just like if you're sure. like doing production and you're checking out like organ sounds or something. Right. And you're like, wow, I can get a better organ sound. Three hours later, you end up going back to the one you started with. Right. And I think that that's a huge thing, whether, yeah, whether you're talking about engineering or producing uh, or even mixing too. It's just like, listen to your instincts because they're, they're usually right. Like there was a reason you just happened to put that mic right there and you checked it out and you went, that sounds good. Great. L go with it. I mean, isn't that the thing too? I mean, I'm sure it's been talked about because we have infinite options and because you can do infinite takes and you can just pile up, right. you know, track after track, it's like remembering that mentality of like Sgt. Pepper was four tracks. Mm -hmm. Like commit. There's nothing wrong with committing and just move on. Right. Those two four track machines linked together. Yeah. They, well, but, right. But yeah, Lim completely limited amount of tracks. I only say that because we get lots of people saying, no, it wasn't. <laughs> well, I mean, the, the, the four track that, yeah, the, no, the, you know, it's been, that's been gone, you know, like bounced the the rhythm section of one, the other one has the Oh, yeah, the bass vocals. and tambourine on the same track. Right. One's boom, one's t -t -t stuff like that. And all the effects bounced on the vocals. Yeah. So when you brought See, the vocal, they committed. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And there's something to be said for that. There's definitely something to be said for, you know, necessity is the mother of invention. Um, when you're forced into... Uh, it's interesting because I imagine you're a jazz player in 1966 or 67. You're going to be going... Look at these new kids, the Beatles, with their multi-track recording. Oh, they hated them. Yeah. So now you're going to be, we could be these sort of stick-in-the-mud guys that grew up making records on tape. Oh, look at you kids with your, with your DAW. We just have to be mindful of the benefits of different ways, restricting ourselves and having unlimited and knowing what all of those benefits are and just using them to the best of our ability. I mean, I love being able to build a lot of tracks as long as there's a vision. I, I won't have... 25 competing backgrounds, but it's great to be have 25 tracks of backgrounds that maybe gets bust to a stereo pair, and I commit to that because I can create all of that stuff. You know, think of a not in love, right? You know, of all of those uh, notes all playing at the same time, and how many they layered and bounced. Well, each one was 16, I believe. I think each, so right? Because they they, they they recorded and looped every note on for an octave, I believe it was, yeah. and then they performed the song by playing back the multi-track and moving up the faders mm -hmm. to, to make the chords. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's a really good documentary. Or, well, it's not actually a documentary. It's like an interview with them. Yeah, that people amazing. then put the, fo the footage, but it's great. So there, there's an amazing idea. So we've got the DAW, we've got these tracks, we've got this stuff. Now, now think about, Bjork did an album a few years ago, All In Voices, that was pretty amazing. Enough of my waffling on, as usual. Um, let's, uh, so you've got, how are you recording drums in here? Well. Got um, a set of API mic trees. Couple of things. I mean, sure. what, are you, what are you using on the drums? I've got four channels of API over here. I have another two channels of API over here. This uh, A2D over here. Right. Uh, which for usually for drum drums, um, bass things like that. And then this is a, a kind of a rare UA model. 
that they made right around the time I was doing the studio. It's four channels that uh, you can switch on and off the transformer. It's not tube, mm -hmm. but uh, this is really good for like super clean things like cymbals, acoustic guitars, uh, oh, great. That, that sort of thing. So those, those are the main. How many mics are you using on the drums? We'll go and look at the drums obviously, but um, it, de it depends on the track, but anywhere from like say seven to 12 maybe. Right. I mean, it depends. Because I do want to commit. So sometimes it'll be more of a, a roomy kind of sound. And other, thing, other times, if you want that woofy sound, like we were talking about the Motown mm -hmm. thing, you don't even have any room mics. You're just doing close mics with compression, mm -hmm. that sort of thing. So it kind of depends. Great. And then what's the Auburn stuff, the par parametric EQ? Oh, yeah. The, the, right. So uh, if I need to patch this in, it, I think I actually did for a kick drum. Right. These are two kind of classic Auburn EQs that I'll track with. Um, right. And then I've got some uh, pair of the DBX compressors here. You use now on the kicks? Yeah, like kick and snare. Great. I mean, again, I don't have necessarily a formula of, of no, exactly what it is. Right. But I, I look at these things as, as tools to help kind of dial in the sound. Because right. I've done a lot of things where drums, the drums I'm playing, are sometimes the last element. Or maybe you're right. You know, you're replacing, but you're that not, happens a lot. But you're not yeah. starting from scratch because that's right. that's actually kind of harder if you don't know what the final sound is going to be of the track. Sure. But if everything's kind of done beforehand and you're just putting like you're replacing the drum. Probably get a lot of that. You know, recording drums for yourself. People are sending you two tracks and go put the drums on it. Right. And that to me is a lot more fun because then you can you know literally dial in and and make it work uh, as opposed to sometimes guessing. And sometimes you don't have to have room sounds if they're going for, you know, more of a classic like Steve Gadd '70s ish kind of sound or something like that. The Bellari. Mm -hmm. There's two things there. There's a, there's a dual mic pre. Yeah, and there's an old uh, compressor too that works pretty that works pretty well. Uh, and this is a mastering compressor, the Charter Oak. So um, you know, one thing we haven't really talked about, and I know you've talked about it on other uh, mm -hmm. episodes, is um, out of the box mixing. Right. So I have do, done that, and that's what this guy down here is, the fulcrum. Yeah. Are you familiar with it? Yeah. I'm sure you are. So uh, like a typical out-of-the-box would be a pairs of stereo outs from the, the Apogees yep. into the fulcrum, and then into usually like the API for like makeup gain. Oh, interesting. Because this thing is passive, right? So this thing, there's no power. It's, it's literally just taking stereo pairs or eight, you know, 16 channels, summing it into two. Right, and then you need to do makeup gain to go back into your DAW, which is where the API comes in. And then for for mixing, I've I've like put this on, which is really great because this is a very clean, transparent um, compressor. Right. Great. And do you find you you like the benefit of coming out and hitting another pair of transformers, etc.? Does that give you? I've you know what's funny is I, I did a mix for a composer friend of mine who did an all in the box instruments. It was all virtual instruments, like virtual orchestra. I did the mix and just for fun, I was like, let me just s send it out and just see what the difference is because um, some people will say if you just take stems out, it's just going to sound remarkably be remarkably better. It yeah. usually doesn't sound like remarkably better. It's going to sound different. In some cases, people will say it's better. It's just. Different. It's different, yeah. I but agree. in this case, all the instruments were orchestral uh, instruments, uh, and it was it was a classical piece. And I summed them out into um, four stereo pairs and brought it in, and I was amazed it actually did sound remarkably better. And I sent him the mixes. So that's actually something that I don't think I've heard many people talk about. Is I wonder, when, when, can, I, can I speculate, is it because it's virtual instruments and they're a little cleaner, and by going through that many transformers and stuff and a little bit of grit, a little extra distortion here, well, make you're, it more organic, if that's a word I, I want to use? I think the thing is, is in the digital realm, mm -hmm. there's like this voodoo of how Pro Tools or Logic sums audio, because it's not actually summing, it's just, it's fuzzy math, you know? What, however it actually takes all those parts and sums it into two. It's not going, obviously, in an analog stage. It's all digital algorithms. So when you've got, and I, I basically just kind of did it in four uh, sections of the orchestra, and when you've got a pair of stereo converters converting, say, just the horns, and then the other ones are doing just the strings, and then the sum of that is being, you know, through the fulcrum, it's coming into a stereo mix, there's 
a lot more discrete conversion going on rather than all those virtual instruments in the digital realm somehow trying to become a stereo mix. It's not that it sounded terrible in the box, but I was just amazed at how those orchestral elements actually sounded better by summing it outside. Because sometimes if you do like a band, you've got instruments and drums, there's going to be a difference, and a lot of times it does sound better. But it's not like remarkably better. Right. If that makes sense. No, it totally makes it, it. It makes sense. I, I I think my gut is is the amount of transformers etc that are being put into it is quite ad, can start especially you're talking about four stereo pairs. Right. That starts to become quite a lot of extra weight that you get from those transformers and op amps and the APIs. Right. They definitely have their own unique sound. And I, I was amazed too on some of the there was actually more high end. For some reason, I was thinking, oh, digital will just capture the high end better. Mm -hmm. But in some cases, there was a bit more crispy high-end summing through the APIs, which kind of surprised me. It's probably additional harmonics that it's generating. That too. So, well, let's have a look at the uh, let's have a look at the the drum setup. Uh, this was a setup I did for a composer friend of mine. I did a drum track for him. Actually, he he had this printed out. <laughs> nice. So we're back to actual, charts. Actual charts. Right. Um, but we must say, even though we've been talking about charts, that isn't every day of our lives. No, yeah. it's not. And in fact, um, kind of like Vinny. I mean, God bless my friend Peter. There, this it it was kind of almost like a six eight feel, but this was written in four four, and then there's all these funny like sixteenth note things. So I, um, you rewrote it. <laughs> I just re rewrote it in my own little short ha shorthand yeah. language. Anyway, I had an engineer that worked for me up until a lot up until recently, who uh, I'd say to him, "Can you clean up this drum track a little bit?" I come back and he'd always take six eights and put them in four four. <laughs> They'd be like, that was uh, interesting. Oh, how's that, a 546? Uh, Unidyne 3, is yeah. that what it's called? I, I know it is a Unidyne 3. Oh, yeah, I, I don't know if it's the same, but basically this, this, these are what we were talking about with the Van Halen session. Really? Yeah. So this was actually a vocal mic. In fact, nice. my, da my dad actually used to use this on his gigs playing in bands in the, in the 70s. So um, the way you've got it set up here, you've got, do you don't have a bottom snare mic? I don't. Is that typical? That's not typical. Oh, okay. But for this, it was it was fine. And then, is, was this the actual positioning of the overheads? Yeah. Let's see. Because, right. Um, so the equal I'll, distance to the center. Exactly. The I'll, I'll basically just kind of measure. Yeah. Because um, I like the snare to be kind of in, in the center. Yeah, and, me and, too. Because, yeah. right, there's different methods. People will just do like kind of stereo overhead micing. Some people do the Which I think is okay if you're going to EQ the, all the lows and low mids out of it. All you get is pss, pss, pss. You can you can get away with kind of liking the symbols, right? But if you want a natural overhead sound, you have to be in phase, right? Yeah, exactly. So yeah, there was one on there, no hi hat mic, uh, because a good amount, at least for this track, was kind of coming from the overheads. Now with this, the beta down there, that's the only kick mic, so you've just got it catching the air. Yeah, great. You know, and th these are those things too. Like you know, you move it like two inches, it's actually going to sound terrible. So it's like mic placement is critical. I shouldn't say terrible. It's going to sound different. Different, right? Not what um, Because yeah. that's the thing, right? With mic placement, you don't know until you actually like listen to it and go, oh, that actually works, like you with the room sound. Now, these, are these the Latvian ones? These they are. are. Uh, what are they called They're again? They're called Jay-Z mics. Jay-Z, that's it. Uh-huh. These are killer mics. And they have, um, they, they, they have a character sound to them. You know, they're not like, um, you wouldn't use them as a reference microphone. But they do tend to be a little brighter, but not in that like Chinese cheap bright mic right. kind of thing. Right. They just sound good, and good. I've, I'll sometimes use those on uh, toms too. And then toms, you've got oh, some little Sennheisers here. Yeah, and Great. they work. And again, these guys, you know, these are very cheap, affordable mics. But you know, you you, I think I, I tried seeing what they sounded like square on like that. It sounded terrible. But like literally moving it a couple of you know a little swivel amount, it was just like all of a sudden there's bottom end. Great. Right. So I've got some muffling going on on the snare and yeah, the Yeah, but you've still got tone. I like tone. Right. When drummers come in on, on my Ludwig and they start dampening off, so it's doop, 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 unless it's a track that needs it, I don't, I don't get it. I, I want, and especially these days, because we're blessed that we can, we can just draw out the stuff we don't want. We can just volume ride it. So I get the old idea of like you didn't want to ringing toms while you're playing. Right. But we've got so many ways of getting around that now. I'd rather have a tom go boom and then pull it out where I don't need the ring. 
And do you sometimes mute like the bottom head? Because sometimes I'll mute. Actually, there's there's a little bit of tape on this bottom yeah. head. This particular drum actually rains a lot. Oh, it does. Which is good for live. Sure. Bad for um, you know, clean studio sound. Yeah, I think we're going to get back to my favorite phrase here: horses for courses. It really depends, doesn't it? Sometimes you want a dead Ringo, T tail snare. Uh, oh yeah. Snare and toms, and sometimes you want ringing like t like there's no tomorrow. Yeah, and <laughs> and I'm sure you've you've talked about this too. It's like as a studio drummer. You have to play to the room and how you're recording sounds too. Like in other words, like I think you mentioned earlier about you know overheads on cymbals. Like if you have close mic'd overheads, you don't want to be smashing them, mm -hmm. especially if you're compressing them and getting a really sure. cool um, kind of compressed groovy sound. Right. You know, a, a, an inexperienced drummer is just gonna hit the cymbals way too hard. Right. But, you know, you ha you kind of have to play. You obviously play to the song, but you also play to the recording, I think. Yeah, absolutely. That makes perfect sense. So, so you have an 87 that, here is your room mic. Right, and that's actually set up in figure eight. I, I just kind of did that randomly, and it sounded sounded pretty good. A little bit lower, you know, so it's getting more of the, the drums and a little less of the cymbals. Yeah, that's, that makes perfect sense. And what are the, what's this up here? That's a J, another Jay-Z mic. Um, that's a vintage 11 that they call. Right. And um, that actually wasn't used for this recording, but I, was doing some percussion overdubs. So it was actually, you know, brought out a little bit more like here. So, and probably pointed a little bit more like that. Uh, which is good, because this is kind of the opposite of this. This has a bit of a taper on the high end. Mm -hmm. So it works great for shakers, um, the kinds of things that you typically will roll off high frequencies after you've recorded them. Because you right. think it's like nice and tasty and crispy, but in the mix, it's just like, yeah, my, you know, know it's it like cut. Yeah. So you built all this, you got mic panels here. Yeah. Great. So in all the orange cable, believe it or not, were handmade by myself. Because when I was actually doing the studio, and it's expensive, I thought about, or I researched how much it was going to cost to buy mic cables. Because you need mic cables, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I basically just took out my old like soldering skills from high school electronics. I don't have any soldering skills. So. Really? <laughs> I've soldered, but I wouldn't call them skills. Well, they were a little. You're bit, ahead of me. They were a little bit latent, but so all the orange cables are actually handmade. Great. So, and you and Simon Phillips. Simon made all his cables. Oh, really? Him. Yeah, he's crazy like that. He did build all his own patch bays, and yeah, must be a drummer thing. Well, <laughs> we throw ourselves into it, you know. Yeah, we're gonna get. You have to get some good stills of the live room here. Yeah. Well, this is. I mean, one of the things that I, I like um, doing is is my own sampling. So the, literally, this piano was tossed down on the corner of my street. In fact, my neighbor texted me. He's like, dude, there's a piano on the corner. So I walked over and literally this piano was just like thrown on the side like, like an old television set. Mm -hmm. So I got another neighbor of mine to come in and pull it in. This thing has been completely weathered. It's not really functional as a proper piano, but what it's gonna be great for. So a lot of my work in sound design for mm -hmm. some of the film and TV stuff, is making my own sounds. So this is actually gonna be like completely multi-sampled, and I'm gonna right. drag it into the middle here, and basically kind of tear it apart. Fantastic. Oh, I like that. All right, talking of film and TV, let's go and talk some bit, a bit about that. Give us your experiences in that. It's one of the good things about getting older is people do take you more seriously. You think so? Oh, yes. Even in our business? Yes, definitely. Well, when it comes to working with artists, I'm not talking about like 
you know the hips the hips the hip A and R guy who's twenty five years old who feels threatened by you because you can run around circles around him. That's going to always going to be difficult because with the younger right. A and R guys, it's like they have no idea what they're doing. They have a rolodex maybe, and they so ageism doesn't concern you. No, not not in what we do. Not at all. Yeah. That's good. So why do people get so obsessed with it? People people do, you know. Well, because I think it exists. If you if if you're going to compete in a world where it's relevant, so don't compete in the world where it's relevant. You know what I mean? So it's a bit like a girl. We we can we can sort of come on to sort of maybe on camera. This is a bit of a contentious one, but it's <laughs> like if, if a young artist comes to you. No, if a twenty seven year old girl comes to you, not old at all, a normal age, completely could be successful. Cheryl Crow didn't get so successful. She was like thirty four. So twenty seven year old girl comes up to you. And is a great singer songwriter and wants to do Britney Spears pop. You're <laughs> like, you're like, you're too old to do that. Like, I'm only 27. It's like, yeah, but everybody that's doing that has a Disney show. Has they can do that super clean ultra pop. You know, it's it's forgivable when you're 13, 14, 15, 16. But at 27, you need to have matured somewhat. So that's a sort of a weird ageism. It's just like it's got to be appropriate, you know. But if a, if if somebody if somebody who's super young wants to do an older sounding thing, then you, you've got to also help them be like, well, yeah, but you're 17. If you're going to do Black Sabbath, that's great, but it's got to be like Royal Blood's version of Black Sabbath. It's got to be edgy and youthful. If you do it authentic, you're just going to sound out of touch. Right. You know, so there, that's where our job comes in. It's like, how do we, how do we best help our artists? You know? Right. And help create them to be the best version of them yeah you know but you see I in what we do I see so many people they come to me and they've already spent a lot of money with different people and they'll play me some stuff and it sonically might be really really good sometimes it sounds fantastic but it's it's it they'll find somebody who'll just take their money and do what they want to do <laughs> as opposed to helping them and they'll might go to somebody whose speciality is whatever genre it is and just it's like plug and play just drop the singer in but there's so much more I mean what we seem to gravitate towards as human beings is something that seems so honest like you know if you listen to Lennon doing Working Class Hero or Bob Marley doing Redemption Song or Neil Young doing Needle and Damage Done when it's just like acoustic vocal songs they're all singing very uniquely about something that makes sense Redemption Song is about slavery obviously makes perfect sense coming from a Jamaican singer like Bob Marley, working class hero. There's a guy who didn't even know his mother growing up, whose father abandoned him when he was a little kid, who basically grew up, you know, grew up with his aunt, just being like, don't listen to me, I'm just another, you know, this is who I am. And then, you know, Needle and Damage Down is about Neil Young using, losing two people in a quick succession to heroin overdoses. Heavy subjects here. But the point is, is like the honesty in them, there's lots of vocal acoustic songs. But those three vocal acoustic songs, you knew. Right. Even if you're not a fan of any, I'm sure you're a fan of all those artists, but you knew those songs. And, and anybody first hearing that can go now and go and listen to those three songs and be like, wow. And they just connect to it immediately. Right. So and, and, those and, are extreme examples, don't get me wrong. We're not going to uh, take every pop girl and turn her into, you know, or pop guy, but it's that kind of honesty and connection that I think. Uh, right. And, and how those things translate in the recording. Is, is, is important too because it's not like rocket science where you have to like use special like you just want to capture that and it's like Adele is going to sound probably pretty good through a 58 as well as a $15,000 microphone of course you know and the same with the, like the songs you're talking about the way that the songs are constructed the way the vocals are are and the melodies are it's just it just sounds good it sounds complete it's not like, oh, we can make it better if we use this compressor and let's use this plug-in for this. It's like the source sounds good, you know? Yeah. And, that's, and that's a huge thing, I think. Oh, I mean, I that's, that's something I actually learned. One of the first albums I produced for a, a songwriter, Jason Witten, we did a cover of Use Me by Bill Withers, which mm -hmm. we kind of did our own little version. And it was sounding good, and I somehow was... Thoughtful enough to go to the original recording, you know, because I was just getting into This is the first album I co-produced with a friend of mine, Sebastian Sheehan. We were two drummers producing this guy. It was, it was a lot of fun. But we There's were kind of... There's a joke in there somewhere. Yeah, there is a joke. <laughs> um, uh, and it was trial by fire, you know. We were trying to, you know, 
we were, we're figuring things out as we went. But I'm listening to the original Bill Withers track, and I'm listening, and I went back to my record, our recording, I went back, and something struck me, and it's it's kind of what we're talking about. Like, it, it's a very stripped down, you know, it's just like guitar, drums, bass, it's very stripped down. But each one of those elements is like super pleasing to listen to from the start of the song to the beginning of the song. There was no like ear fatigue, because mm -hmm. oftentimes, and it's not, I don't think it's just digital recording, I think it's just some of the parts that a songwriter might play or mm -hmm. the, the part that somebody plays, it gets fatiguing after a while and then that translates into the recording mm -hmm. or maybe it's a lack of a, a feel because like the Bill Withers stuff just has, it's just dripping with feel. But my point sure. is it's like referencing the original track when we were doing a cover, I learned really quickly that ours was needing more of that element. It wasn't just like s setting up mics, oh, this sounds good. It's like, it actually has to sound good from like beginning to end, which I think a lot of these old recordings and famous recordings we're talking about has that built in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. Well, what I love about you know Motown as a genre in particular is like you take any great Motown recording, you had the best songwriters, you had the best musician in every position, the best drummer, the best bass player, the best guitar player. You had the best string arranger with the best players. And the vocalists. The best, and I was going to get to that, and of course, the best <laughs> singer. So you had all of this stuff. So you had, like, you had, you know, you may have had Marvin Gaye on it, but you also had everybody underneath. And then, of course, you drop Marvin Gaye over the top of it. And it's, and it's nothing Marvin Gaye. It's just, and I, I, did, uh, I did a couple of seasons of X Factor as a staff producer, and they, uh, you know, each week there'd be a different theme or something and were you recording the shows and mixing it kind of thing or no no no. i was producing the tracks oh okay so i produced the tracks that would be on there and oh, they would cool. come in with different themes and uh one of the themes one week was motown mashups so we were to take a motown song and a current song and kind of pull them together and sort of take elements of of the modern song with elements of the class a classic motown song so they had to pre-clear songs obviously before you right could. they don't want us to start working on a song and then the writer says no or the label says no when the publisher says we want 10 million dollars <laughs> exactly whatever it might be so they came in with a a, a wad like this of pre-cleared motown songs oh so i'm thinking to myself oh yeah there's loads of motown of course there is you know i'm a huge motown fan like anybody rational but i didn't realize there's like you know whatever 70 songs on this sheet, 100 songs on this, on this sheet. So I'm like, I know this song, you know, I'm like, hit, 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 no, this song, this song, this song, this turn it over, no, this song, and I just kept turning it over, and I'm just like, in my, I just didn't realize, subconsciously, whatever it is, there, there was like several hundred songs, like in the high hundreds of songs, and I don't think there was a song I didn't know, because it goes so deep, it's all that Stevie Wonder, which you forget. It's all that Lionel Richie and Commodores you forget. You think Motown, you think Temptations, you think of all that kind of Staxy, Atlantic Motown period of the 60s and late 50s, but you don't realize it went all the way through the 70s. Oh yeah, and the 80s. And the 80s, and it's just, you know, it's the pop of like Lionel Richie and Commodores all the way back to all of the great, it's like just covers like so house. much stuff. Just you knew every song from "Ain't No Man in High Enough" to you know three times a lady" and everything in between. Right. Insane. Right. And you put it on and, and you listen to every song and you're like, best musicians. Best so did you mash musicians. it up then with like a more modern kind? Yeah, of Yeah, I, I don't even remember where we ended up. I was so overwhelmed with that stuff, but uh, yeah, it's it's great. And I like I Motown is very inspiring to listen to on so many levels, production and um, performance and. Great. So look, I'm waffling on. I want to know where you're doing very well in film and TV licensing. Right. So tell us a little bit about, so first of all, how did you get into that? Uh, well, a friend of mine who was recently into a music licensing company back in 2005, uh, that we were, we were actually in a band together, he called me and wanted to know if I had any kind of like drum-centric music. And I said... And, I, and it, right, in 2005, this was before it was what it is now, where like everybody is trying to do music licensing. This New was, Gold Rush. This was like, back then, I'm like, and I said, yeah. And I didn't have anything, to be honest. So I went in, and I just recorded like five little ideas. Because what I said was, um, I have a couple things that I've started. Mm -hmm. 
but uh, I'm not sure if it's the kind of thing you're looking for, but I'll, let me just send you what I have. And he goes, oh, great. So I kind of sketched out these things and sent it to him. I'm like, oh, they're great. And we ended up um, kind of co-producing those particular tracks together. Um, and that was like very, the very beginning was just saying yes, right? Like just jumping in there because um, if you thought about it too much, or if you hadn't done it before, you might say, well, I don't know what that is. But it kind of started spontaneously like that. And yes. then the relationship with some of these companies has grown over the years. So, uh, and I'm talking about music library companies, but you know, music library companies kind of have a history of, at one point they sounded like Muzak or something, mm -hmm. but there's actually high quality music that can come out of some of these companies. And some of them are very good. Uh, you and I were talking about it earlier that there are some bad ones, and there are a lot of bad ones. But if you do your homework, and especially if you have a good relationship with the people that work there who are actually going to go to bat for you and your tracks, you can do really good work. You know, there's, there's opportunities there. It's not just signing on to a company because they're talking a good game and saying, oh, we love your music, mm -hmm. sign to us, give us all your publishing, you know, mm -hmm. and um, we'll, we'll get you on TV. We, we, like, we like you. It's like, no, you... You want to be smart about these things sure. and find and develop good relationships. Because ideally, the best thing is somebody calling you for your music. Of course. Yeah. Um, and that's basically where a lot of these companies can help until they actually start calling you directly for these things. And I've done a little bit of freelance things where I've done some video game music for a company, like five uh, iPhone apps, which was actually super fun. Um, but in terms of people actually calling you, you know, until your phone's ringing off the hook, hooking up with a company that you feel good about and you have a good relationship with, I think can be positive. But you just have to be smart about it too. Yeah, there's, I, I've got a million questions. Um, I think the one that's going to get asked, and we talked about off camera, but is the number one a question is, um, now you, somebody approached you and they said, I need some music. They already had a relationship or they already had a music licensing company? They already had a music licensing company, or they were working for a music licensing company. That was just getting off the ground at that Cause point. Because I think the, th the number one question I know people are going to ask, and we, we talked about off, off camera, is is like, well, how do I get people to hear my music? Right. Without, you know, running the risk of just sending it to 55 different libraries, and then they just take the publishing, quite frankly, and then you never hear another thing from them ever again. Well, I think that's one route. Um, you know Pomplamoose? Remember those guys? Yes, I do. So to me, they're like a, a perfect example of someone that other people could kind of do some modeling after mm -hmm. because they had their music, they had their own style, they had their own YouTube channel, they had their cool, quirky YouTube videos, and I, obviously one of the big keys to their success was all the crazy covers, cool covers that they did. And they mm -hmm. did unique covers. They weren't trying to sound like the original. They, they did their quirky two-person two group thing. And they went from doing that and creating a presence online and getting a lot of fans. Uh, and then next thing I know, I remember seeing them on like a Target commercial. And I'm sure. like, there's something here. Like, this is a way to get to like music licensing or getting your stuff out there and being aware is, you know, taking your career into your own hands and doing what you can to, you know, put it out there. Not so much like self-promoting, but more about sharing what you do and hopefully the, the work that you're doing is inspiring to other people too like sure. in their case she was cute the music was good they were quirky and there wasn't really too many other people doing what they were doing so it caught on and people a lot of people were really aware of who they were and what they were doing which i thought was really cool i thought they were really in, inspiring yeah i i agree i mean they did they, they did exceptionally well and got a huge amount of views but i would say even if you just middle, middlingly get views it doesn't matter. I mean, it's, it's about doing something consistently and getting stuff out like that. Right. Yeah. Um, which you can do. And, and what it would mean to do it today, because I, mean, I mean, they're a little on the older side now, and like whatever that means for today, you know, not so much like, again, self-promoting, because you and I probably have both have people we know on Facebook, and the only time you ever hear about them is, we have a new single on iTunes, we're mm -hmm. playing a show, and it's like, okay, okay, I, I get the promotion, but I want to know like more about who... Sure. You are and what you're doing and like draw me into what you're doing, sure. not just like sell me your stuff, totally. right? Because it's that old saying, right? People love to buy. 
um, but they don't like being sold to. Sure. <laughs> it's yeah, true. Absolutely. Now you're doing a bit of everything. So you obviously have music in libraries where you have, and you're also in a fortunate position now where people specifically ask you to make music for purposes. Like you were talking about games, apps, right? Um, presumably trailers. Trailers are a big thing. That's mostly through the licensing companies that we're talking mm -hmm. about. Um, like I've, had, I've had a couple of trailers and they can be quite lucrative. Right. There's, no, resi super... there's no residual if it's playing in a movie theater, but no. the upfront money can be really good. Right. But that's a super competitive world too. In fact, a, a lot of what we're talking about, like music licensing, it's so saturated now that I think if somebody wants to get into that world, they have to figure out what kind of music they're, they're doing that they can do well, like mm -hmm. better than anybody else doing that style. Because um, I think there's the thought too that you could have a million different kinds of styles. Like you could do a bluegrass track and a hip hop track and you just try to like put out whatever music you have. I don't think that that's going to work for a lot of people. That might have worked, it has worked for some composers like 10, 12 years ago. They could put out massive amounts of tracks and they'll get traction over time. But now there's so much, it's so saturated mm -hmm. that you're way better off you know, dialing in on what makes you unique in your sound, whether you're a guitar player and maybe you can do some sort of cool style or some spin on a style that really exaggerates what you do on guitar that you can't do with a plug-in or that you can't do with virtual instruments, like something that has sure. a real human quality to it. I mean, I, I think that works in my case in a lot of ways because coming from a drumming background, whether it's stuff I'm doing virtually or stuff I'm doing in, in there, I, I, I have a sense of, of rhythm and how things work together and how music works and sound design works and that's kind of my specialty like i don't do hip-hop tracks for example like i could probably do a hip-hop track if someone asked me but i'm a white guy from orange county you know i'm not going to do a compelling hip-hop track mm -hmm. uh, that's going to be you know uh competitive with, with the current sure. state of hip-hop so you know it's like focusing on what you're good at i think so you're not doing icelandic death metal mm, no well did sugar <laughs> do death metal yet <laughs> Who knows? Thank you ever so much. I, I'd like you to be involved in any questions or comments below. Okay. Okay. So you notice how I throw you under the bus on camera? Because <laughs> there's probably going to be some licensing questions. And, um, you know, neither of us are, are authorities, but that's kind of what I like. I like non-experts. I like people that are actually doing it. Because the experts don't usually actually work in the field, there, but they know all the right things. This is... And what they, and they will about. talk a good game. And they'll talk a good game. What yeah. I like about what we get to do for a living and we get to make music and record and work with artists, and you're, you know, you're more successful in film and TV licensing than I am. I've had lots of stuff, but I don't concentrate on that, where I know from your Facebook feed, strangely enough, I see you working on a lot of stuff. Being in the trenches and understanding this to me is, is a big deal because, as you're saying, as you just explained, it, everything is evolving and changing and shifting. And like I was saying earlier on, it's kind of the great gold rush. I get hit all the time with film and TV licensing questions. And everybody's trying to do it, and it's very saturated. However, if you do it smart, there's lots of opportunities. Right. But the, the biggest thing we, like we were talking about is it, people make mistakes where they give away their music too easily. Um, and I don't want to be negative about certain companies or certain people, but... It doesn't take too much research to find out whether something is legitimate or not. Is that correct? Well, yeah, and, and there's this, I would call, unfortunate standard with a lot of these companies that think that they should take half of your publishing, which is kind of the standard. Right. Like, if somebody calls you and directly, there's, like, you're 100%. But when you work with these licensing companies, the standard thing is to split publishing, mm -hmm. you know, split the copyright, which means, you know, if you are a songwriter and you've got like heartfelt songs, you know, you're not just doing music for that thing. If, if, if you're an artist out there and one of these companies comes to you and says, you know, we love your music, sign, sign our agreement, we'll, we'll get you on film and TV, a lot of times they don't realize what the publishing even means. So they'll sign and all of a sudden, like half of their song now is co-owned by some company and maybe they're gonna do something or maybe they're gonna not. But I find having seen so many deals, 50-50 is a more favorable deal now. As you know, most, a lot, a huge amount of companies, 100% of the publishers. 100%. See, that's just 
It's just not right. <laughs> I mean, and it's, I think it's a thing. If, if more people will stand up and say this is unacceptable, then hopefully that will go by the wayside because, you know, it's like in my world of, of composing, um, a, a lot of young composers will, will do gigs for free. You know, they'll, sure. they'll, they'll try to work on a film completely yeah. for free. They're getting the name out there. They're and there's to... nothing wrong with that. But the problem is, is when the people try take advantage of that and then some, at some point that becomes, like, acceptable. Like, it is one thing if you're younger and you're trying to break in, that's fine. But, you know, there's a lot of um, opportunities out there that, you know, come score my independent film. No budget. You know, and sure. in one case recently, I saw somebody was actually asking the composer to pay five thousand dollars into the 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 fund of the film, and I'm like, wow, that's 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 go that's going to a whole different level. Sure. Yes. Well, it can be a minefield out there, but let's uh, let's see if we can help educate people and help people. And, and uh, once again, being smart. Being smart. Thank you ever so much for for taking the time and uh, showing me. I I love it. Love your journey. I love the story. So please. As ever, leave a bunch of comments and questions below. I'll throw John under the bus and make him answer them. I'm ready. I'm ready. Okay, I'll good. share whatever I know. Okay, marvelous. Have a marvelous time recording and mixing. Thanks very much. Thank you.